On behalf of the World Affairs Council, I'm Allison Arieff, your moderator for this evening. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's distinguished guest, Dr. Anthony Townsend. Anthony is a research director at the Institute for the Future and a senior research fellow at New York University's Rudin Center for Transportation Policy and Management. He is the author of Smart Cities, Big Data, Civic Hackers, and the Quest for a New Utopia. Previously, he directed research on urban technology and crisis communications at NYU's Tobe Urban Research Center and was a Fulbright Exchange Scholar at the Seoul Development Institute in South Korea. He was also one of the original founders of NYC Wireless. He holds a doctorate degree in urban and regional planning from MIT, a master's in urban planning from NYU, and a bachelor's in urban studies from Rutgers University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Townsend for a discussion of smart cities. Well, thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Um, just wanna talk uh, for about 10 minutes about the book, um, just to give you a sense of you know, how I see the city um, and the forces that are shaping it going forwards. And Smart Cities is really um, about what happens when cities take over the world and when computers take over the city. Um, you know, urbanization and ubiquity of technology, if you will, um, which is actually the title of the intro, which um, I think lays out the big important ideas. And when I finished the draft of the book about a year ago, I went back to, to write a few um, pages to kind of set things up in the beginning. And I realized that, um, you know, we kind of already crossed over into this future. Um, we're about five years into it because in 2008, there were three really important thresholds that we cr crossed globally. Um, the first one, which has been very well publicized, um, is that the world's population is now predominantly urban. So around the end of 2008, for the first time, more than 50% of people uh, worldwide were living in cities. Um, basically, uh, that all happened in the 20th century. So, you know, 1900, world's population is about 10% urban, 90% rural. Three or four generations later, um, it's, it's predominantly urban. So that's a big deal um, because we're on our way to, at the end of the 21st century in 2100, being about 90% urban worldwide um, with a population that's probably going to be close to 10 billion people. Um, so what that means is in the next 100 years, we have to build cities for as many people as we've built in all of human history um, to date. So it's a pretty amazing construction project that we and our children and our grandchildren are gonna see. Um, the other two things that happened in 2008 um, relate to technology. And for the first time, there were more mobile broadband lines worldwide than, than fixed wired lines. And so um, you know, as we're becoming an urban species, the internet is becoming untethered. Um, to use a fantastic word that uh, the U.S. military actually uses to talk about mobile communications. And then the third thing that happened, this third threshold, was uh, that for the first time in 2008, and we didn't know this until, until a couple of years ago, uh, Cisco Systems down in San Jose published a study saying that in 2008, for the first time, there were more things connected to the Internet than people. Um, so, you know, grad students uh, hooking up their coffee pot to, to Facebook um, you know, buses with GPS trackers so that cities can, can, uh, can map the location of buses and tell us when they're going to arrive. And that's a really um, important development because it tells us that the future of the Internet isn't about creating these virtual, non-geographic places where we go and talk to each other. It's about stuff in the physical world, uh, you know, that's, that's near each other, um, talking to each other. Um, and really about instrumenting all the objects and buildings and infrastructure in a city um, to be smart. And that's really you know, where the title for the book comes. Um, and so what's exciting about this, I think there's a, a lot of people um, in different walks of life and institutions, I'll talk about this a little bit. What's exciting is that um, you know, we know that urbanization uh, is driving global economic growth. Um, it's driving the rise in uh, carbon emissions that's, that's contributing to climate change. So in a lot of ways, urbanization is part of the problem, um, but it's also part of the solution. And uh, I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of hope that even as we um, kind of uh, uh, are going through this really uncontrolled period of economic expansion, that we can, we can do it in a, in a much more intelligent way and put systems into the city that will undo some of the, some of the bad consequences of that. And so um, 
when you hear people talk about smart urbanism or smart cities or smart growth, um, they often talk about a lot of things, um, you know, good policies, good urban designs, walkability, biking, that kind of stuff, um, when they say smart. And um, I took a much narrower definition of it for this book, that smart, smart cities are cities that are using information technology to address timeless urban problems. And the reason for that is I don't think technology is the silver bullet or band-aid that's going to um, address all of the problems that we face in this century of cities. But I think it is a big part of the solution, uh, and it needed to be treated separately. So basically, um, you know, the way I like to think of the book is that it's, it's kind of a political economy of this smart city movement, looking at all the different stakeholders, um, big technology companies, uh, startups, uh, what I call civic hackers, where people that are um, basically um, you know, crafting their own technologies to address the problems that, that they see. Local governments are very active. Um, city of San Francisco is one of the, I think, leading lights globally in terms of trying to, to use technology. Um, and then um, I actually have a whole chapter that is about the urban poor, both uh, here as well as uh, in the developing world. Um, and that's actually where the book started. Um, in 2010, the Rockefeller Foundation approached uh, the Institute for the Future and asked us to um, uh, do a 10-year look at the future of uh, what they framed as cities, information, and inclusion. Because they were really worried about, um, you know, they were excited about the opportunity to use technology for economic development to create opportunities. Um, you know, if you look at what's going on with mobile phones around the world, they really are the world's computer. And poor people all around the world are using these technologies to create a livelihood, to get access to health information. But they were also worried that um, you know, uh, real estate developers, land speculators, um, corrupt officials would be using these technologies as well to exploit the poor and, and create new exclusions. And so um, you know, that, that whole uh, uh, notion of um, do people have access to technology and the digital divide, um, you know, we really saw that it's just a way too simplistic way of looking at the problem, that it's actually a lot more complicated than that. Um, so, you know, a lot of it sounds like it's kind of a really futuristic book. Um, there's a lot of technology. I really went to great lengths to um, explain it in, in terms that, that a layperson can understand. Um, but the stuff is, is complicated. Most of it's invisible. Um, you don't see it. It's not like um, the urban transformation in the 1950s and 60s when we were plowing expressways through vibrant urban neighborhoods and displacing hundreds of thousands of people. Um, you know, the, 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 the displacement in the smart city happens when someone fires up a computer program or turns on a sensor um, or, um, you know, changes a number somewhere in a piece of software um, and all of a sudden uh, resources are flowing in a different direction. Um, but, um, and so this stuff is futuristic, but I think the most fun that I had was actually digging into the, the history of the smart city and realizing that cities and information have always uh, been part and parcel of the same phenomenon of, of our civilization. You go back to um, the earliest cities in Mesopotamia in the Middle East, and you know, it wasn't until uh, nomads settled down and became farmers and started forming villages and towns that they invented writing um, because they had to start keeping track of all the laws and the religious beliefs and who owned how much grain that was stored in the granary. Um, and as cities have grown throughout history, they've challenged us to create more and more sophisticated technologies to count and track and analyze what's going on. And my favorite example of this is, um, uh, uh, in the United States um, in 1880, um, U.S. Is, is, I mean, at the peak of the Industrial Revolution, Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, I mean, these cities are growing faster than anyone has ever seen cities grow before. And Congress is basically a bunch of uh, rural landowners. And they're seeing immigrants show up, speaking strange languages, living in, in tenements, and, and they're completely freaked out by it. And so, uh, and the economy is changing very quickly as well. So, 1880, they issue this massive expansion of the U.S. Census that generates so much data um, that it takes seven years to tabulate the results. So, they're coming up on 1890, and they haven't even finished counting counting the last one. Uh, and they know that 1890 is going to be even worse, and basically the results will be out of date. Uh, and so they. Um, call upon an enterprising uh, former census clerk, a guy named Herman Hollerith, 
who um, had developed, he saw this problem coming, and he had developed a electromechanical machine. It's about the size of this podium, had a bunch of dials here, and it was a punch card reader. And um, it allowed the Census Bureau to do the work that had taken seven years in about a year and a half. Uh, and it was a really just a revolution in information processing. Um, and he started leasing these machines to the census, to governments all around the world to do their own censuses. Uh, railroad companies were using it to manage their far-flung empires. And um, it really starts to revolutionize um, business and, and government. And he starts a company which, um, uh, through a series of mergers and acquisitions, ends up becoming IBM um, and really transforming the world as we know it. Um, and what's interesting is that IBM, um, since 2008, when the recession hit and you know, their corporate customers stopped spending and started hoarding cash and governments started spending stimulus money, IBM has been the most vocal voice um, promoting this idea of smart cities um, and using information technology and big data as a way of getting handle on cities. And so it just kind of blew my mind that um, you know, the company that wants to use technology to rebuild cities now is, is one that um, uh, was formed at the birth of our own kind of urban culture here in the United States. Um, the last thing I'll say about the book is that, um, you know, it's really global uh, in perspective. And, um, you know, people always ask me, what's the smartest city on the planet, right? And, um, yeah, if I was really cornered, I would probably say Singapore. I mean, no, no place has used technology uh, to, change, uh, to change the city more than Singapore. Um, but in all seriousness, usually what I say to them is it's the one you live in. Um, because most people in the world um, are kind of stuck where they are. I mean, there's a lot of migration, but for the most part, people, people are stuck where they're born, um, particularly in the developing world where I think a lot of the problems are really going to be most acute. And you kind of have to deal with the situation that you're given and, um, you know, take the technology that's available and address, you know, the problems that are, that are, um, that are really pressing for you. And so, I mean, the, the book is kind of a whirlwind tour around the world of, of places um, where people are coming up with different ideas about how to use technology to fix problems and then sharing them between each other. And there's a really rich international trade in these innovations right now. But places like Rio, London, Barcelona, Bangalore and in India, uh, Seoul and South Korea. I mean, these, these are really the places where um, you can see bits and pieces of this future uh, urbanism uh, showing up. So um, that's sort of my overview of, of what I thought was important and why I wanted to um, write this book and share it with everybody. So um, I think we'll move to some, some dis discussion now. Thanks. So I was telling you uh, in the green room that I was at the Smart Cities Conference in Barcelona last fall. And huge, huge event uh, that is mostly there to showcase um, really innovative trash bins and, mm -hmm. and bike share, stuff like that. Uh, but the electricity went off during someone's panel, <laughs> begging the question, uh, what happens to a smart city when the electricity goes out? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think so. Um, I look, uh, one place where you can see that really starkly is in the photographs that came out of Tokyo after the tsunami. And, you know, Japan had basically lost a significant chunk of its electrical power. Probably one of the most, um, I mean, even 20, 20 years in, in, in a deep recession, you go to Japan and it still feels like the richest country in the world. I mean, it, it is such a technologically sophisticated society. Um, and to lose your electrical power in that situation um, and see the bright lights of Shibuya Crossing, which is Tokyo's version of Times Square, completely blacked out due to power rationing, um, I think really hammers home this notion of can you, can you build a, a technologically enabled city that can fail gracefully? Um, rather than blacking out, maybe it can brown out a little bit. So um, you know, maybe the, the traffic prediction uh, algorithms don't completely shut down. They just, they just get a little slower or a little less precise. Um, or the smart water system doesn't completely stop pumping water. Maybe just the pressure goes down a little bit. And there's a lot of people in industry that are trying to understand um, how they can do that. Um, but it is it's something that they have to be asked to do because it adds cost to this. And, you know, I worry in a world where, um, you know, you see Yahoo um, not securing our communications and letting the government kind of have free reign on it, 
because they don't want to spend the two or three or four percent extra that it would cost to, to use encryption. It's 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 a tough world. Um, I have a whole chapter on this stuff. I, I love the bugs in smart cities. Um, you know, like when you see like a public display that's showing the Windows blue screen of death. Um, you know, the, the crash screen from Windows, and it's just like. Wow, I mean that's the piece that they're showing us, and that doesn't right. work. What about the the stuff that's controlling you know the air conditioning or the elevators? Um, and so I have a whole chapter that that looks at sort of the risks and unintended consequences of smart cities. That this is like my Tom Friedman chapter. It's called Buggy, Brittle, and Bugged, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, buggy in the sense that we're doing this very quickly, and there's going to be mistakes made. We're going to have you know things like Y2K that are going to um, cost a lot to undo. They may they may hurt people. Um, certainly cause economic damage, right? So, you know, we've just been through this two or three day sh strike on BART, um, you know, which, which got resolved, thank God. But 2007, um, there was a software upgrade on BART that shut the system down for a couple of days and cost hundreds of millions of dollars in lost productivity. So um, these are the kind of things that like, we really need to anticipate um, if we're gonna do this well. I wonder if it's feeling like there's enough people focusing on that end of it though, oh, it's, I went to another fascinating conference that they didn't call it this, it was another smart cities conference and it was actually on procurement. And I realized the reason they didn't call it anything to do with procurement is that no one would have attended. <laughs> 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 but so many of the issues that smart cities as a huge umbrella needs to solve are really unsexy issues like government procurement. Or, I'm going to I'm going to try yeah. to make the procurement sexy because okay. it is it is <laughs> well, so someone, someone has to. it is so important <laughs> um, because it really speaks to how cities uh, source innovations right um, and my perspective on this is informed by a very brilliant guy who's based in Barcelona named Sasha Hasselmeyer that was who his conference. okay he um, he started a group called City Mart and where Sasha comes from. Uh, is basically having worked with tons of startups all around the world that have fantastic technologies, urban technologies, um, parking payment apps for mobile phones, or um, navigation systems for blind people that um, you know have incredibly precise maps that um, you know will guide them like down to the center meter, and it knows whether the sidewalk has a has a you know a, an accessible ramp or not. Um, and these companies go bankrupt trying to sell the solution they developed for their home city to other cities around the world. Because the way cities don't buy technology like a company does, they don't look for the best in class solution and, th and then you know, cut a deal. They don't look around the world. They look for the guy that they went to high school with or um, you know, the company, the local company that, that might be able to do this even if they're not the best in the world at doing it. Um, and basically every city ends up getting a, a really poor version of uh, the technology that's developed by a local company that may or may not really have this, the, the, the chops to, to do it well. Um, and they, they replicate each other's efforts, they reinvent the wheel, they get um, mediocre uh, technology that citizens kind of shun, because mm -hmm. uh, it's not very good. And, and th my favorite example that he uses is in Germany, uh, like the, the 24 or 28 largest cities in Germany all have their own mobile parking payment app. Mm -hmm. And so not only do they all stink, <laughs> but when you drive from one city to another, you have to download a new <laughs> app to pay for parking. Um, and it's just a really kind of ridiculous situation. And, and what he's trying to do is get cities to um, uh, basically evaluate and endorse the companies that they work with and let other cities see, you know, like, okay, um, San Jose bought an app from this guy and it was the best in the world. Uh, so I'm just gonna work with them mm -hmm. instead of, um, so it's basically, it's like a peer referral network for cities around smart solutions. It's it's really interesting dilemma though because on the one hand you could move towards that and get the referral from someone who's done it right but then on the other hand as you mentioned you have the IBM or the Cisco who wants to sell this massive software package and is there sort of a middle way between you know a city committing to something that may sort of be obsolete as it's being implemented on such a grand scale or at least yeah sort of no more I mean I, I think the way to think about it is. Um, you know, should cities have to go to um, an IBM or Cisco or Siemens every time they want to do something smart? Because those are the only people that can sort of tap this global pool of innovations and, and bring it to a city. Or should they be able to do something like go to an app store like we all do when we decide, you know, we want we want a piece of software. Um, and I think CityMart's model is, is to be the app store for smart cities. 
And I think, um, you know, I think it's the right model because the innovation is all coming from the grassroots right now. I mean, if you look at um, one of the companies I write about in the book uh, is uh, called C Click Fix. And this is two guys in New Haven, Connecticut, who wrote the app that hundreds of cities are using now um, as their interface for their, their 311 system. Um, and allows you to complain, you know, about potholes. And if I complain, you can give it a thumbs up, mm -hmm. and you can sort of vote the issues to the top, and you can see what government's doing about it. There's an accountability piece there. Um, and it was two people who were fixing their own problem. Uh, and I don't think anyone at IBM would have ever set out and said, hey, we should build a 311 app, mm -hmm. um, because they weren't asked to do it. So, What have you seen in terms of positive developments? Um, I think that C-Click Fixes is one great example. Uh, there's... I think uh, increasingly ways for citizens to express their, whether it's a complaint or suggestion, et cetera. What's helping the governments to respond to those complaints? Have you seen any sort of smart city innovation that's helping it from the other end? I, I think you know? um, it, it's a really interesting tension because um, citizens are starting to expect out of government the same level of customer service and same level of repeated constant innovation and product improvement that they get from the private sector. So, I mean, you know, right, like the new iPad came out today. Like, that's what we, we're starting to expect that from government, right? Um, and they have absolutely no capacity to do it. Um, in fact, their capacity is shrinking because budgets, um, you know, every city in the world right now is operating in sort of a fiscal emergency. And that is true in the US, it's true in Europe, it's true in China. Um, and uh, so, what it's doing is it's forcing cities to get incredibly creative um, about how they spend their own resources and how they leverage mm -hmm. external resources. And San Francisco, um, Jane Nath here in San Francisco is doing an amazing job trying to figure out how to leverage the tech community to do things for the city um, and to you know have a strategy and a roadmap that shapes that. Um, Boston is a city that I write about a lot in the book that um, has created, so Tom Menino has been mayor in Boston for I think almost a quarter century. He's leaving office at the end of the year. Um, and um, Boston Magazine in the 90s called him the urban mechanic because he loves to like really get in and tinker with systems and change things um, and, and sort of roll his sleeves up. Uh, and about three years ago, he set up a task force that was really his smart city task force. It's called the Office of New Urban Mechanics. And um, it's a handful of people with pretty minimal um, budget. But their job is to basically run around and find um, uh, you know, groups in government, whether it's in schools or uh, you know, health services, that, are having pro that have problems that they can't make any progress uh, against, and then to just pour resources on to leverage grants from foundations, to leverage uh, pro bono services from the private sector, and to like, really solve problems quickly. Not always using technology, but, but often using technology. And what I, what I say in the book is that it's the first smart city framework that I had seen that looked like it was designed by a political scientist and not an not mm. a, a electrical engineer. Um, it was really designed to be problem focused and citizen focused. Um, and so just one example of, of something that they did actually working with Code for America, um, which is based here in San Francisco, um, uh, Boston was having a, a very difficult time with their school choice program. Um, and uh, the process for figuring out what schools your child was eligible to go to were really complicated. And it was like this 17-page brochure that had all these diagrams. San and Francisco. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Um, yeah, I think a lot of cities are grappling with this. And, um, you know, it was a very complicated system. Uh, the Boston Globe was giving Menino a lot of, a lot of hell about it. And, um, you know, the new urban mechanics is basically to come in, uh, able to come in within a matter of months, deploy an app um, that would basically let people just type in their address, where the siblings were going to school, and it would it would spit out the list of eligible schools. Um, and it wasn't the the website or the app that was so exciting; it was how fast they did it. Because again, back to procurement, they didn't have to issue an RFP, they didn't have to evaluate ten different companies. They had their own task force that could just go build the thing. And, uh, and get it running so that it wasn't obsolete and out of date by the time it actually reached citizens. And I think that way of thinking is, is a really new thing for a lot of local governments. And um, it's, 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 what's, it's responding to um, you know, our experience in the marketplace. Companies you know, 
this is how companies work. This is how they deliver services to us. And um, you know, again, I think we're starting to expect that out of government. <coughs> Uh, the Boston example is heartening because uh, it sort of brings to mind what's going on here, for example. There's a plethora of fantastic apps that will tell you what time the minibus is coming, but that no amount of great apps are going to fix the fact that your bus is probably really late and it's really dirty and it's really slow. So d do you feel that the, the rush to create these albeit helpful apps, is a good thing, but then is maybe neglecting sort of a, a larger systemic problem that, that all the enthusiasm for the technology sometimes can't really get at or they sort of choose not to, or do you see that changing at all? Well, so I think uh, there's a whole bunch of things to dig into here, but one of the really interesting things about um, uh, real-time government data and transit systems, I think, are the ones that have, have really made the most progress um, because you know the real-time data is so valuable. Um, is is that they um, all that real time data makes you start thinking about long term issues and um, again back in Boston there's a uh, yeah. one of the first sites that was that was built using the the real time arrival data from from the T was called How Screwed Is the Orange Line and it was just a site you would go to and it would tell you oh it's pretty screwed <laughs> it's it's not really screwed it's really screwed it's actually there's another version that's more profane uh, than than that. Um, <laughs> But um, I started looking at that, and I was like, no one's going to use this to find out when the next train is coming. Like, this is, this is to draw attention to, you know, are they investing in, the, in maintaining the rolling stock? Are they, are they investing in track? Are there labor issues that are causing these delays? And it, it starts to make you think about the system and not about, you know, just me as an individual who's trying to get something done. And I, I talk about this in the book. I call it thinking long term in real time. And I think um, fundamentally, these real-time streams of data about, about what's happening in cities are going to change the planning process. And I think they're gonna empower citizens and activist groups and, and community groups to start um, uh, you know, commencing the planning process rather than just responding to uh, government plans. And if you look at like, um, some of the dashboards, the, a lot of cities around the country have been putting up these performance dashboards, I think, um, uh, Los Angeles is the most recent one. You know, it's, it's all the different operations of the city. It shows you sort of the recent past and, and current performance. And it boils it down, you know, to like an icon. It's a green icon for getting better, a red one for getting worse. And, um, you know, these things are on the web now, but people are going to start pushing that information out into the places where people have conversations about politics and about community affairs, in the corner stores, in the barber shops, in the churches. And people are going to have that in the background, and they're going to get angry, and they're going to get mobilized, and they're going to they're going to they're going to want stuff. And I think it's really fascinating. And um, I'm doing a lot of thinking right now, particularly around transportation planning, how we're going to prepare our government institutions to respond to that, because um, you know these are organizations that think in in terms of, of decades, mm -hmm. and to be able to respond to you know very fast emerging, very um, well-informed citizen demands is going to be a real challenge for them. Yeah. There's a lot of questions about transportation, so I, I want to ask yeah. a little bit about privatization. Uh, there's a great sensitivity right now about all the private corporate shuttles that happen right now. There's several new um, smartphone-enabled car sharing services. There's a new company starting that's going to sort of replicate certain Muni routes, but it's a Jitney. I think yeah. it's going to be $6 to go the same route that Muni would cost you $2 instead. And so the concern is with all this private transit that maybe that transit advocacy for the the greater good is is going to decrease. Is that a yeah? I mean, that you San Francisco is ground zero for this stuff right now, um, and and I th I think it's fascinating the capacity for innovation that you have paired with the total incapacity <laughs> to deliver <laughs> performance on the government side. There's really nowhere you know where you have like such extremes. Um, but and I've been following this debate about the the marina shuttle um, uh, downtown shuttle, and I think those are all really valid issues. Um, but what I haven't heard, which is what a lot of people are talking about on the East Coast, is that that kind of innovation in transit is is not the exclusive domain of wealthy people with mm -hmm. smartphones. I mean, we have hundreds of thousands of people a day in the New York area um, riding on dollar vans yep. that they summon with SMS and they pay for, you know, with pocket change. 
and they get better service than I do taking right. taking mass transit. Um, there's a lot of issues around safety and and um, you know uh, labor practices and and uh, passenger safety. There have been some you know sexual assaults and things like that. But um, you know I think it really speaks to um, you know innovation is not the exclusive domain of of well-off people. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of um, a lot of very creative entrepreneurs who can um, patch those gaps for poor people as well as rich people. Okay, for sure. Uh, it's funny. I don't. You can't really call the university of the future a smart university in the way you would call a smart city a smart city. But you get my meaning. I feel that there's a lot of parallels right now between uh, debates happening in education mm -hmm. and in cities, and that technology seems to be the solution. Give every kid an iPad. Everyone takes a an online course instead of going to college. Do you see those parallels happening? And is this just sort of the time we're in that there's so much? technological innovation that that's kind of the de facto solution for whatever challenge people are facing? Yeah, no, I mean, I think a lot of people are saying, and this is also a very, um, I think, Silicon Valley view of the world, um, you know, that higher education is ripe for disruption. Uh, I don't know, you know, <laughs> higher education is more or less unchanged since medieval times. <laughs> it's a pretty resilient institution. Um, you know, it's, it's outlasted governments and several world wars. So I think um, I think higher ed still has some, some fight left in it. But, um, you know, it's, at the end of the day, higher education is, um, it's like the ballet. There's no way to make it more productive one year to the next. And so relative to the rest of the economy, it keeps getting more expensive. I mean, it is a performing art. Um, and I think um, I'm more inclined to see, um, to see sort of innovation at the edges of, of particularly higher education um, uh, you know, um, making, making um, you know, the, the time that you spend outside the classroom more productive. Um, uh, I'm involved a lot with New York University, which is um, probably the most intensively used university campus on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. And the way that they've improved productivity is by scheduling 7 a.m. to 7 right. p.m., 365 days a year, continuing education. Um, I mean, there's so much... There's so many ways to make a university more financially viable than by um, putting it all on the internet and sending everyone home. Um, and you know, the, 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 the initial set of results from these massively uh, online open courses is that nobody's learning anything. Um, <laughs> they're really not performing well. And so um, yeah, I think it's a bit of a hype bubble that's sort of in the process of yeah. popping. And that's why I think it's sort of a similar thing just as the Cisco's and IBM's like, buy our big thing. Yes. This is you know, the same kind of large entities that are, oh, if you do this, then in this mass scale. Um, it's a great question that I think relates to a lot of the stuff you're talking about is where do state and federal government systems fit into smart cities? It seems to me very much that smart cities have kind of enabled the the mayors to yeah. shine in a way they haven't before. Maybe you could speak to that. Well, I mean, the United States is a country that doesn't really have an urban policy at the national level, um, although we're sort of flirting with the idea of having one right now under this administration. Um, and so, you know, a lot of what happens with states is, is states are very parasitic of their, their big cities. Um, you know, they, they, in the same way that, um, you know, there's a handful of states that somebody showed a slide the other day, which blew my mind. It was, um, you know, states that uh, get more money from the federal government than they give back. And it was basically like a blue state, red state map. And the slide was called red state socialism. It was really <laughs> funny. Um, but, uh, you know, I think states sort of, you know, uh, feed off of, of their most productive cities. So a lot, a lot of times what you see is states kind of interfering with innovation at the local level. Um, and, and the number one area where that has happened, and I talk about quite a bit in the book, is, is around um, uh, public, publicly owned internet services, whether it's Wi-Fi or fiber. And probably half the country right now, it is illegal under state law for a city to um, get involved in almost any way in building uh, telecommunications infrastructure. And this was a fallout from um, what Philadelphia tried to do in 2004 and 2005 under John Street um, and build a city citywide Wi-Fi network to break this duopoly of, of cable and, and telco um, that was you know, artificially inflating prices and slowing, um, slowing speed of deployment. Um, and you know, the, the telecom industry went out and lobbied every state in the country 
and got these laws passed that um, you know basically blocked cities from from doing this. And it's uh, I remember at the time one of the FTC commissioners said, you know this is this is like as if a bunch of book publishers went to the state legislature and said public libraries are a terrible thing. We have to ban public libraries. Um, and uh, and he, he literally said this is an insane policy, um, but it was enacted. Um, the federal government, um, I think with the exception of the, the BTOP program, which was a, a, the broadband piece of the stimulus bill, which funded a, a bunch of very successful projects that have become models, um, including um, Chattanooga, Tennessee's project, where they, the Electric Power Authority there, which is owned by the city, um, as, as many are throughout the country, um, used uh, the, the stimulus money to run fiber optic line to every building in the city, every home, every commercial building. And now this kind of third tier backwater city um, is, is probably got the fastest internet service of any, any place in the world. And there's actually some growing evidence that it's now resulting in relocation of firms and startups and things. Um, Google's pro fiber project in Kansas City is, is another example of that. Um, you know, there's a lot of evidence that people are moving to Kansas City to, to start companies so they can have access to this next generation mm -hmm. technology and understand what it's useful for. Um, City of Missouri or Kansas? Uh, both, actually. It was originally just Kansas, but then Google decided to expand to, to both cities. Um, and uh, yeah, so other than the broadband funding, the federal government really hasn't uh, gotten very involved. Um, and there's one particular area that uh, I really have a bug about because I live um, just across the river from New York City um, along the waterfront in New Jersey. And uh, after Superstorm Sandy last year, we lost all power and telecommunications for like eight days because the cell networks all went down. There were 4,000 cell towers just in New York State that went down, a couple thousand more in New Jersey. Um, and this is, this is how we communicate. This is like the nervous system of our society. Um, and we had our fire department was sending um, foot messengers across, across town to, to get information around. Um, and it's totally unacceptable state of affairs. Um, that, you know, when we need these networks most, they fail us. And Chuck Schumer, the senator from New York, you know, very angry a month after the attack, bang, you know, it's demanding that the Federal Communications Commission do something about this and make the wireless carriers put bigger batteries and generators on their cell sites. And you know, these guys are sitting there with their tens of millions of dollars that they spend on campaign contributions and, and lobbyists, knowing that they were never going to be required to, to do anything differently. And I think that's that is just a total failure of um, the federal government to ensure that we have the communications that we need in the event of a large disaster. And I mean, God forbid, you know, when when the big one comes out here, because you're not going to have communications. Um, I mean, you know, the government will have some emergency networks, but the, the millions of people that respond to a big disaster are going to be totally cut off. Um, they're going to be more anxious and freaked out because they're cut off. And we see this time and time again in every big urban disaster now that the wireless networks are the, the first thing that go, um, even though they're the most critical. So, so uh, to speak of other technological failures, where does the Affordable Health Care Act fit into this whole thing? Yeah, I was thinking about this today. Um, I'm not an expert on, on that stuff, but I think what you can see um, in this, this website, um, you know, uh, debacle. Yeah, debacle, <laughs> I guess, that's been happening, is um, a couple different things. Um, but I think the complexity of big uh, information infrastructure um, that sort of interacts with the physical world and large numbers of people is something we haven't quite figured out how to do yet. And I see, you know, a real canary in the mine shaft there um, for smart cities that, um, you know, even, even, you know, consultants that... Uh, should be able to do this well, um, aren't able to do it well. And governments aren't able to evaluate that they're not doing it well. And so they launch the service even though um, no one's really quite sure if it's going to work or not. So, um, you know, that to me, that to me was, was kind of the, um, and, and, and this notion that you would have single points of failure is one that I get into a lot in the book. There are a huge number of services that we all use online every single day um, that are housed in a handful of buildings in Northern Virginia and the Pacific Northwest because Northern Virginia, just because of history, that's where the internet, the crossroads are. Um, uh, uh, Pacific Northwest because there's lots of, of cheap electrical power from, from the dams. Um, and uh, this you know, came to light um, in 2011 
um, Waze, this company that Google bought this summer for a billion dollars. It's a crowdsourced traffic and, and wayfinding app. Waze actually started in Israel, and it was incredibly popular in Israel. Um, the point, the summer of 2011, like half the country was using Waze as their GPS, or half the drivers. And there was a, a big thunderstorm in Northern Virginia. Uh, a couple trees got knocked down, fell on some power lines, and they knocked Amazon's data center offline. Um, Meanwhile, in Israel, several million people all of a sudden lose their directions and their navigation system and their traffic information because Waze was using Amazon as their, their cloud <laughs> infrastructure provider. And so a tree falls in Northern Virginia, <laughs> and Israel suddenly is locked in gridlock for six hours. Um, these are the kind of things that we're going to be facing, I think, on a more or less constant basis. There are a lot of people um, outside the U.S. that are, are really wary of uh, how dependent the world economy is on a satellite system that's run by the U.S. Air Force, the GPS system, and not being run very well by the U.S. Air Force. I mean, these satellites are old. They're not being maintained and replaced on the basis that they should be. And that the, the event of a, um, the risk of a, a global GPS meltdown is like almost a certainty at this point. It's just a matter of when. And so a lot of people are thinking about, um, there are competing systems. The Russians have a system. Chinese are in the process of, of launching one. Uh, the EU has one uh, about you know, designing devices and services that you know, are at least ready to, to go over to those other networks, if not using them all the time. It does feel, even with these things that happen, that we all sort of have this <laughs> assumption of safety and, and, and security. I'm, I'm one, it seems to me that you know, the affordable health care website will get itself worked out, but then will sort of the, the like, hack into the public record, the, the medical records of people who have signed up for it sort of be the next thing. And I wonder if you can speak to the role of privacy in the, in the I mean, which is obviously vast yeah. in this subject, but something that you must have come across in a million contexts. It, it's, it's so pervasive that um, you almost can't talk about it um, because it, um, and uh, that, Buggy, Brittle, and Bug chapter. I finished writing that before Edward Snowden started making his <laughs> announcements. And um, I kind of wish I could go back and rewrite it, because the world I described actually looks right. pretty privacy conscious compared to the world he's describing. Yeah. Um, and I think you know, if you look at um, you know, Chinese hackers were inside Google for a year before they figured it out, I, I think you can pretty much just assume that there really aren't any walls anymore. Um, and all of that information that's being recorded is available to unauthorized person, unknown unauthorized persons. And that's scary. Um, so the question is, what do you do about it? Um, probably the most interesting thing that I've seen at the city level is a project um, It's being run by a, a foundation in DC called uh, New America Foundation. It's very active on telecom issues and spectrum policy. And it's called Tide Pools. And basically what it is, is it's, it's think of like Google Maps, but running off your Wi-Fi router at home. So it's, it's a local community mapping app um, that stores all the data that people put into it on your local network. It doesn't send it up to the cloud. It doesn't send it to Google, to Apple. Um, and it's a parallel to this whole movement around, um, there's at least a dozen projects, startups, uh, that are trying to create personal data lockers. Mm -hmm. So rather than just giving all my data that I create to Facebook or to Twitter, I would selectively release that when I want some service that they can give me based on that data. And this is sort of think like the neighborhood or community level equivalent of that. And it's really interesting because it builds off a really rich literature um, going back a couple decades uh, in community economic development um, around what they call uh, asset-based development. And it was a group of scholars, mostly out of Chicago, who were saying, you know, if we're really going to um, uh, think about economic development in poor communities, we have to stop talking about all the things that they're lacking and start talking about the things that they have and totally change the conversation around the assets that they do have. A lot of this is long before social networks online, but a lot of it was about social networks and relationships and uh, you know, focus on the healthy families that are working well and, and try to, um, you know, build off of that. And, um, you know, this is basically, this is like the Google Maps that builds on that tradition and that approach to development. And, you know, th I think the aspiration is that one day some business may come knocking and say, hey, I'll pay you to use some of that data because I need, I need data to run my business. I need data about your community to offer my service there. Um, that may not happen here, but if you look in the developing world, uh, I think it's very possible that you could have 
um, you know, slums of a couple hundred thousand people deploying this kind of system and then saying, hey, you know, Vodafone or Orange or Google, if you want to offer your services here, you got to buy our data. You can't just have it for free. I think it's a really interesting vision um, that, that would address so many of these concerns around privacy and security. So we've been talking a lot about the cloud. Let's talk a little bit about sort of being on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of this data is being incorporated into apps and sort of little messaging to your start f smartphone that you could be walking down the street and you get this little message that says, Anthony, you would really like to have, you know, pizza at this restaurant on Valentin 22nd. You should just stop in. It's sort of telling us what we want before we know that we need it. Um, how is that kind of experience beginning to affect our experience as kind of urban citizens walking down um, the street? It's both making cities, I think, more serendipitous and less serendipitous. Um, more serendipitous in the case, in, in the sense that those kinds of apps, and, and Foursquare is actually an app that does something like that. Um, they've just recently, it's, if you don't know, it's sort of a Facebook for places, and you kind of check in and say, I'm at this place, and they can tell you what your friends thought about that place, or um, you know, if there's specials that you can get there, what's, what's good to eat and drink. Um, and they've deployed the service now that will do that. Like at 11.45, it'll say, psst, I bet you're getting hungry. Um, <laughs> you know, there's some place down the street that you might like because your friends liked it because other users with similar tastes like it. And um, in that sense, it's going to put you in situations that you probably wouldn't have gotten into voluntarily because you would have just gone to your regular spot. Or you've gone to whatever was closest to your office. And um, something that I'm, I'm working on right now is trying to understand how services like that are interacting with new modes of transportation, like our new bike share program in New York City Bike. Um, you know, are you willing to try something that's a little further away than you would have walked to because you can hop on a, on a bike share and get there faster? Um, and I think that kind of stuff is fascinating because you can start to think, all right, we can start to redesign neighborhoods around this combination. Um, you know, maybe, maybe we can put the libraries a little further out from the subway station because people will know that they're there and they'll be willing to travel a little bit extra because they can go faster. And so that lets you spread the value of that train station over a much larger area. And this is stuff that, like you can start to attach numbers to it and the numbers are pretty big um, financially. Um, but in the, in the other sense, um, you know, the idea that there's an algorithm somewhere that's churning away these instructions <laughs> to me about what to do um, and you know, clearly um, it's a marketing technology, right? right? Um, that I think is, is somewhat sinister. Um, and uh, it's just, it's so um, difficult to detect what like the larger impacts of those kinds of things might, might be added up over millions of, of, of uh, times that it happens every day in a city. Um, and, uh, you know, who has access to those? I mean, literally these people are programming us. Um, through these technologies. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of hype, uh, uh, rightly so, about open government data over the last five years. Um, you know, San Francisco, New York, these cities have been putting tremendous amounts of public data online in a single place that app developers can use. Uh, and I think that's great. It should continue. It should spread. But what I'm more, more worried about than, than the data that's behind closed doors is the software that's behind closed doors in government. And um, not only is it so, you know, the tool that, uh, you know, uh, whatever, a, a school manager uses to draw the district lines or, um, you know, run the lottery that assigns people to schools or, um, you know, how how social services get distributed or, um, you know, where the police go to enforce noise code. Um, software is helping people in government make those decisions, but we know nothing about that software or the assumptions that are programmed into it. Um, and they probably don't either because they're just buying it. I mean, it could be some guy in a, in a call center somewhere in India that's programming these things based on his life experience. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> engineers make assumptions throughout the design process that get written into code and basically act like as law. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, the scariest part about it is that not only um, do we not know what those assumptions are, um, is that we have no way of getting to it. So most of the open data laws in cities in the US actually specifically exclude software code from disclosure. It's to protect the, the vendors that sell it to them. Um, we don't know whether Freedom of Information Act or Sunshine Laws can be used to get access to this stuff. And I've actually been um, thinking about like a test case in New York 
um, if we could, you know, identify s like a piece of software that we want to find out how it makes decisions, you know, that we could basically do a, a FOIA request and try and get access to it. But um, to me, you know, we really need to see this stuff. To, it's, it's almost like if we had like an urban design code that was being enforced, but nobody knew what the code was. I mean, that's how, that's how opaque this stuff is. Yeah. Um. Google Glasses, good or evil? <laughs> uh, evil. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I mean, I think I actually tried it for the first time uh, a couple weeks ago, and I, I have pretty bad vision in my right eye, so it wasn't a very pleasant experience to start with. But I just started, I was very disappointed. I thought it wasn't very intuitive, um, particularly, you know, in a place like Manhattan, where I spent a lot of my time. I am working so hard and spending so much money to experience that city, <laughs> and now I've got this thing in between me and it, and um, it's not very useful. It's, I think it's actually interfering, so um, I think it's, it's going to be a sort of longer takeoff for that, that kind of stuff. Um, and the, just the whole, the whole idea of everyone having a different reality, um, that's really what Google Glass is about at the end of the day, and I find that really deeply disturbing as, as an urbanist because um, you know, it means you can start to people are going to start ignoring place. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think you're going to get the same, the same impact that you had um, when people could start driving out of the city at the end of the day and going home to the suburbs. They're just going to stop caring about the public realm, and I mm -hmm. think that's a really bad thing. Yeah, and it becomes so mediated. Uh, I walked into a butcher shop the other day, and there was a little crew of people in Google Glasses watching a butchery demonstration through the glasses, but they were right there. Yeah. There was no reason to watch it through, <laughs> another, <laughs> through another layer. I just think that uh, people increasingly have even lost the awareness that they're mediating all their experiences that way. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I could say in defense of glass, and, and, and you know, Google people will say this, is, it's better to look through the glass than to be looking at a screen all the time, which is what people are doing now. And I think, I think there's some merit to that. I mean, you know, that technology comes from a, a fighter cockpit technology called heads-up display. Mm -hmm. The idea is they didn't want fighter pilots staring at the instrument panel. They wanted them, you know, looking up. Um, aside from the fact that, you know, we would all be wearing a technology designed for fighter pilots, which is crazy. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that from a uh, user uh, experience information design point of view, that's what they're trying to do, is they're trying to get your head up and looking at the world rather right. than looking at a screen in your hand. I think there's something to be said for that approach. Right, but also that, um, do you think that there are, and maybe this is too difficult a question, but do you think there are a diverse enough group of people working on these issues and really kind of defining all the problems we need correctly, and I'll give you an example. I went to go visit uh, Cisco's home of the future about 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and the engineer was taking me on the tour, and he said, and there's this great feature, you can turn the oven off from the backyard. <laughs> and I said, I would, no one would ever want to do that. <laughs> you know, so are you really thinking about what people actually need? Is there sort of an, enough ethnographic research? I mean, there's tons, yeah. but, but are, it, Bloomberg had a quote in one of his exit interviews with New York Magazine in, in, in which he said, you would be shocked to see how few people are making decisions about this sort of thing. And I wonder if you agree with that. Yeah, smart homes are just like something that has been uh, misunderstood by companies over and over and over again. I spent some time in Korea in uh, 2004, and um, you know a lot of um, these big integrated conglomerates that had both technology arms and construction arms were trying to build smart homes because Korea was the most wired country in the world at that time. Like 80% of people had broadband internet um, versus like 15% here. And they would build these smart homes with all these technologies. And the only application that people actually wanted was a natural gas leak detector. They wanted something that would ping them <laughs> if there was natural Because there had been a series of highly publicized um, gas leak apartment <laughs> fires because of shoddy construction practices. And so that was what was on people's minds. That's what a smart home meant to Koreans, was an alert to tell you if you have a gas leak. Um, and it wasn't even like you could remotely shut it off. It was like, so you could run home and shut it off, <laughs> which I thought was fascinating. Um, but um, I think in terms of who's doing the innovating, I think this is a big, big, big problem. Um, uh, you know, I write a lot in the book about um, the interactive telecommunications program at New York University, which to me sort of embodies um, the, the, a smart city um, 
where the technology is designed by the people that are using it, sort of people fixing their own problems, crafting their own solutions using very cheap open source stuff, not waiting for IBM to come in and fix it. Um, and at the end of that piece, um, you know, I, I interviewed Red Burns, who is this, um, uh, she was actually doing smart cities in the days of interactive cable in the 1970s, building, you know, basically like Skype-like chat systems for, for senior centers in Reading, Pennsylvania. It's really fascinating stuff. Um, and she recently passed away, um, but um, what she said to me at the end of that interview was, you know, I don't understand why more of these kids aren't working on social issues, essentially. Um, and it was why she had founded that program and, and you know, why she had spent her whole life building it up. Um, you know, she was interested in using technology to address social problems. And I think, I think that's a, just an endemic issue. I mean, you could, you could probably categorize all the apps for Android and the iPhone, and 98% of them were written by white guys under 30 with incomes of six figures or more. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think city governments are finally starting to understand that when they, they do these apps contests, and a lot of cities have done apps contests, that they need to really engage uh, NGOs in a systematic way, um, nonprofits, community groups around the city to define what the problems are for the geeks to go work on. Because the geeks will just build bike, you know, bike route apps and, and coffee finders. Um, and it, it, it's what happens. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's a great exploration of what the possibilities are um, for building a smart city, you know, that's designed by citizens, but it just needs to be a more inclusive group of, of citizens. And this, this non-representation exclusion thing is, is endemic to smart city endeavors. And it's really because, um, you know, a smart city service or smart city technology, it's not like a park. You can't just walk in and, and do it or use it. You have to connect. Mm -hmm. You have to log on, usually. You have to be literate enough to request what you want from the system in, in the right way. And those are huge barriers. Um, and if you look at um, 311 systems, you know, non-emergency telephone hotlines, this is the most democratic, accessible, smart city service you could possibly design. 24 hours a day, uh, uses the terminal that is, everyone has, a telephone. You don't even need to be literate to be able to use it. And most big cities, it's available in every major language group. Um, yet every city that I've spoken to, New York, Vancouver, Chicago, 311 is disproportionately used by native English speakers. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for this. Um, but when you pair that with the fact that a lot of cities are now using the 311 calls as a, as a triage system for where they're allocating these scarce resources, you think about it. You're designing a system that the most privileged people are using to complain more and get more. Mm -hmm. And if that's baked into the simplest, most accessible system, everything else is, is more exclusionary than that. And so I think... Um, one of the things I propose in the book is that we need to basically have something that's like, like the environmental impact review process for every smart city project where you sit and think about, you know, who's benefiting and who's getting screwed and what are the unintended consequences and how do we develop a plan to mitigate that? Because otherwise you're just, um, you know, basically going to be deploying things that make inequality worse. And, um, you know, that's not good in general, but from a political point of view, I don't think, um, you know, mayors and, and civic leaders are going to want to get caught with that at the end of the day. So, Okay, I think I have time for one last question. Um, you spoke at the beginning about cities and increasing populations and how cities are our future. Uh, that said, suburbs are very alive and well and many in need of fixing. Uh, what can all the smart city stuff do for the suburbs, yeah, if so anything? I think the most interesting... Um, trend right now is around automated vehicles, going back to Google, um, because one of the, the big issues that we're facing with the suburbs is boomers aging in place, or boomers not being able to age in place. Um, you know, and the day will come when um, your vision goes, your legs go, maybe your mind goes, and you can't drive yourself to the doctor. Um, you can't feed yourself. And um, there's some people that are saying this is going to be such a big problem that it's going to it's going to hold the housing market back for decades because um, no one will be able to buy these houses in the suburbs that are that are being left empty. Um, you think about self-driving car. I mean, if if you can press a button and the car comes and it takes you to the doctor and it takes you shopping and does everything else you need, I think that extends the viability of, of suburbs for for retirees for for a long time, um, and uh, 
that's a really interesting possibility um, in terms of the health system and quality of life. But it also puts off this reckoning, a day of reckoning that we have to have with the suburbs, that they're ve it's a very energy intensive mm -hmm. form of settlement. Um, and we're gonna need to re-engineer it to make it sustainable. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, to see how it plays out. Um, the other thing about the self-driving car that a lot of people are talking about is that if you can get in the car and kick back and you know, fire up a video conferencing right. session with your friends or your colleagues, and you could have a three-hour commute each way. I mean, you could have people living in the Sierras commuting into San Francisco. Um, and there actually are those people already, but they're, they're outliers. And if, if that kind of living becomes the norm, again, that's a huge sustainability question because, I mean, you, you could be talking about, um, you know, having a metropolitan area that's 500 miles in diameter. Um, people, you know leapfrogging the exurbs and building in, in, you know, the last bits of wilderness that we have left. Um, and uh, I think, you know, it's, it's um, something that needs to be dealt with. Um, the good thing about that is I think we're going to have plenty of time to anticipate that because, um, you know, even though this car has been driving around the Bay Area uh, for a year now, I think, um, you know, it still costs like $100,000 to build or something. So It's not I mean, imminent despite, yeah. despite what they might say. Yeah. So. Okay, well, um, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. I want to encourage everyone to buy a copy of Smart Cities. It's a terrific book. And thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.